Thank you, Kevin. Um, okay, so I'm actually wondering if I can switch to a handheld mic now that I'm <laughs> now that I'm here. Uh, I do want to be able to move around just a little bit more. Sorry, I, if it's easy. Um, uh, I don't. I don't like to be constrained to the podium, uh, and I should have thought about it before now. But it, but as you can see, I have a, a lot to think about. Um, so awesome. Let's see if this will work. Hello. Can you hear me? All right. Great. I'm going to do this. Okay. So that's okay. Come on in. Have a seat. <laughs> so I want to start with some good news because actually there's a lot of good news. I've been doing this work for, I've been vegan myself for 27 years uh, and I've been doing activism work in the realm of environmental and animal rights for um, about 25 years. And, uh, and there's some good news. Uh, I have seen a major, major, major progression progress just in the last few years. And the stats are actually reflecting that. So the US eats a lot of meat. You know, we, I, I think everybody knows that. We eat a lot of meat. In fact, we eat the most meat of any country except for Luxembourg. Luxembourg is the only other country that eats more meat than we do. So we eat a lot of meat. Uh, but that's changing. It's changing dramatically. Um, between 2007 and 2012, the U.S. meat consumption dropped by 12.2%. Wow. Wow. I feel like I did something. My work is, you know, it's like, yay. Um, it's amazing. It really is. And it's, it's worth celebrating. And during that same time, the U.S. population actually increased. Uh, it's not like there's less people in the U.S. We had a, a massive increase um, of people in the United States, uh, but because of the per capita drop in the amount of uh, meat consumption, we've actually been raising and killing several hundred million fewer animals in the U.S. Wow, it's incredible. I know, it's wonderful. Um, absolutely, so there's the good news. And beef is the real, the real plummeting number. Um, beef consumption has been uh, actually dropping over the last two decades, and it's down 20%. Um, and this is good news. That's great. But in the environmental community, in the environmental realm, um, when it comes to you know, environmental information around our food, um, there's kind of a dangerous message um, that we're hearing. And a lot of it is that beef's bad, Sometimes you'll hear dairy's bad, that the cows, you know, are the, the, the real impact. And, oh, you can just switch to chicken or fish. And, oh, that, that's really a lot better. It's a lot better. Well, I'm here today to tell you that actually, uh, unfortunately, it's not. It's not that much better. In fact, in some cases, it's the same or worse. Um, so it's a dangerous message, and I'm, I'm hoping to counter that today and give you some information around that. And, um, you know... There's also, too, on an ethical level, there's a, um, a hierarchy in people's minds, uh, uh, psychologically, where they place animals as far as um, if animals feel pain, if they uh, are emotionally complex, if they um, you know, can, can suffer, things like this. And uh, when, when people are asked and there's studies done, dogs and cats always on top, dogs and cats always on top, pigs and cows somewhere in the middle, and chickens way down here, and then fish at the bottom. Um, people always put chicken and fish in this lower category, thinking that they don't feel pain the same way, they don't uh, have emotionally complex lives, and, um, and I'm here to dispel those myths, uh, because it's untrue. They're animals just like us, um, and they suffer the same as us. So, um, but I want to get into the environmental, since this is an Earth Day event. And we'll start with chickens. So comparing the production of chickens and cows environmentally is like comparing rotten eggs and apples. Uh, I'm sorry, rotten eggs. <laughs> rotten <laughs> apples and oranges. Uh, neither one is better. OK. So having hundreds of millions, and that's, you know, that can be a, a typical egg and, and chicken operation, hundreds of millions of animals um, concentrated in these areas where there's uh, water problems, air problems, I'll get into more detail, um, massive pollution problems. For every pound of feed that goes into a chicken, a pound of waste is created. 
So um, we're talking a huge amount of waste. Um, you know, not only the waste, and we'll talk a little about that, but a lot of birds die before they even get to the slaughterhouse. Um, this is a mass grave. I know the, the, the um, uh, quality is not very good, but these are all chickens. Um, uh, all here, dead chickens that, you know, <laughs> could have died for numerous reasons. They could have been breeder chickens. There's millions of breeder chickens that are, uh, are, are, are raised just for their sperm and are, you know, killed. Um, without even becoming meat. Uh, there's birds that die um, just from, you know, disease, sickness, um, being, you know, beat up by another chicken. It's, it's really very brutal because of this intensive, intensive confinement. Um, so there's diseased carcasses from the slaughterhouse uh, that are poisoning the water, and I'll get into more of how that works, but what, you know, what's going into the waterways is feces and heavy metals, chemicals, bacteria, pesticides, uh, parasites, pathogens, cysts, viruses. Um, this causes, causes you know, millions of pounds of waste that's polluting our waterways. And not only all of that, but the poultry litter. So what poultry litter is, is when, uh, you know, they're first uh, in a, in a uh, this is chicken meat farming, okay, broiler chickens. They'll put sawdust down everywhere. Um, and what that becomes very quickly is um, a mixture of fecal droppings, feathers, spilled feed, antibiotic residue, heavy metals, cysts, larvae, dead decaying birds, dead decaying rodents. Um, you know, and the chickens, of course, have to sit in this for six, six weeks before they're slaughtered. Uh, the, the poultry litter has four times the nitrogen and 24 times the phosphorus found in pig and dairy cow operations. Uh, so it's very, very pollutive, and I'll explain why phosphorus and nitrogen are, are, can be bad. Um, but there's also wet manure. I don't have a picture for that one, but you know, a one million hen complex, for example, produces 125 tons of wet manure a day. Um, again, very, very pollutive going into our waterways. So what happens is it causes eutrophication. Eutrophication is a uh, basically lack of oxygen in the water is um, one way to describe what it is. What, what happens is all those nutrients I was talking about, the phosphorus, the nitrates, um, they go into the waterways, they cause the algae to bloom. The algae loves it and they eat it up, but it's an unnatural balance and that algae will block the sun from coming through to the living beings. It takes the oxygen, sucks the oxygen out of the water. So the fish and the aquatic life die. Uh, this is happening all over our waterways uh, in the United States because of animal agriculture, severe eutrophication. And some um, uh, industries or, or some of the poultry farms are wanting to incinerate the waste, the poultry litter and other things, uh, with incineration devices that they're like incineration machines that they're buying, saying this is more ecological. But guess what happens when you burn this stuff? Okay, well, then we're gonna get, uh, you know, toxic emissions like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide, sulfuric acid. Now we're talking about greenhouse gases, okay? Um, you know, hydrogen oxide, it goes on and on. Uh, volatile organic compounds. So it, it, and it's no solution to, to incinerate this stuff. And, you know, people, not only the people, but the chickens, living in this, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the waste, the poultry litter, they get respiratory issues, um, they have problems uh, in their respiratory system, the chickens themselves, as well as the poultry workers and people that live around these areas. Um, I mean, these are, these are massively pr polluting, uh, terrible. Um, and, you know, I, I work for United Poultry Concerns, uh, and we have a, a, a bird sanctuary with chickens and other birds um, at the uh, eastern shore of Virginia, and we have over 100 resident birds there. And uh, my boss, Karen Davis, who is amazing and a hero in our movement, um, she is uh, very involved in all the chicken farming that's happening there, um, the, which is massive. <clears throat> and uh, she uh, sent me this, the chicken industry um, 
is polluting the Chesapeake Bay so profoundly that the Chesapeake Bay Foundation announced, quote, a moratorium on new chicken houses may be necessary if Maryland and the EPA don't step up. The eastern shore can't absorb the manure as the soil is already saturated with it and has been for years. So chicken farming is absolutely environmentally detrimental. Don't think it's any better. Um, so another, uh, you know, something that we're hearing about a lot, of course, is the free range and sustainable myth. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, and I actually wrote a whole book about this, <laughs> about small scale farming called The Ultimate Betrayal Is Their Happy Meat, where I go into great detail about each of these labels that we're seeing and I expose the truth both ecologically uh, and ethically. Um, but, you know, a small farm, it, it's not the answer. And the reason I use this picture is that this is a cage-free operation. Okay, this can be labeled cage-free. Uh, it's an egg operation. They're not in the battery cages, but wow, does this look like an ideal life for a chicken? No, absolutely not. Um, you know, they're, abs they're crowded in there. It's absolutely miserable. They're still de-beaked. Uh, they can't escape. Um, it's, it's, you know, dark. It's dank. They can't dust bathe. They're, you know, they, they, they have such amazing... Um, uh, behaviors that they do that they love, sunbathing, dust bathing. Chickens are incredible little creatures. All of this completely denied uh, in, this, in these operations. But the reason I use this picture is because this could be also considered free range. All a farmer would have to do is open a little door to, you know, a little five foot by five foot concrete patio that's so unappealing no bird would want to go out there. And he has that open maybe an hour of the day. And he can call that free range because the birds have access to the outside. So, <laughs> you know, it, it, it really these labels mean nothing. Um, they're, they're, they have very, they're zero regulation except for organic, which does have some oversight and actual on-farm inspection, uh, but it's more for environmental reasons and not for uh, the ethics of the animals necessarily. So oftentimes, even in organic, it can be even worse, but that's a whole nother talk. Um, so, um, smaller farms know better. Uh, they still use the same amount of resources. You know, it still takes the same amount of resources to raise, transport, and slaughter billions of animals. Um, currently, 55% of our fresh water in the US goes to animals raised for food. 55% of our fresh water goes to animals raised for food. Um, that wouldn't change because the farm's small. You know, it, that doesn't change. Um, and, at, and this is very interesting with water use. You know, we often hear, oh, dairy, dairy uses so much water. We hear this in California, right? Well, dairy takes about three times the amount of water as an equivalent uh, plant source of food. Uh, but eggs take 10 times the water and chicken meat 14 times the water. So very water intensive, chicken and eggs. Um, okay, and I'm gonna show you just this one chart. There's a whole bunch of these. Did it not? There it is. Okay, and this is typically what you see when you're comparing um, you know, uh, uh, animal foods and plant foods with environmental issues. Um, you'll see this with water use, you'll see this with you know, uh, greenhouse gases, but this particular one is land use. And um, of course, beef is the worst, pork and chicken not far behind, but compared to the fruits and vegetables, you know, it's a huge, huge difference. I mean, this is the comparison we need to make, not just beef to chicken, you know. Um, and let's go back to that free range operation. Now, what if it was maybe like pasture based where they are actually giving the chicken some space? There are some, some um, farms that are doing that, giving them a little more space. Well, you've got to use way more land for the same amount of chickens. So now that land use goes way up, you know? And if we wanted to actually truly free range, um, you know, the, 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 the animals um, for, for all this local farming, I mean, we're gonna have to destroy, you know, forests and wetlands and open spaces and prairies to accommodate all these local animals. We don't have the space. Um, Free ranging, uh, free range, sustainable, all these labels, it's really just a, a niche market for a few elite buyers. It cannot scale up to the billions of people on this planet. We don't have enough planet for it. Um, so, um, 
If everyone in the United States skipped one serving of chicken a week, the carbon dioxide saving would be the equivalent to taking more than half a million cars off the road. One meal. What if we went vegetarian? <gasps> what if we went vegan? Can you imagine the carbon savings? We could turn this greenhouse gas thing around. We could turn the global warming thing around. Um, it's, it's just critical at this point. Our diet is so, so key to this. And yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing how much impact is there. Um, so, you know, we don't want the chicken industry in our backyard, right? We've, we've learned now what a, a horrible polluter there are, they are, the, the air pollution, the water pollution. Well, we don't want them in our backyard. Well, guess what? The planet is our backyard, okay? So we've got to do what we can to make this a livable planet for everyone uh, and get the chicken and eggs out of our kitchens. So um, one, I do want to talk a little bit about chickens themselves. Um, they're just amazing creatures. I, I love chickens. And actually, this one over here, this is Florence. And I rescued Florence and her six chicks uh, from a gas station, um, right? Like they were, she had given, you know, uh, uh, she had hatched her clutch in this little, um, just a little patch of, of, of bush outside a gas station door where there was nothing around but, you know, cars and parking lot. And I was like, what are you doing, mama? <laughs> Let me get you out of here. Um, so I put her in my car and, and uh, drove her out to Goatlandia, which is a new farmed animal sanctuary. You'll see their, um, their booth out there. They're one of our sponsors. And uh, they um, took her in. And they have not only goats, but chickens and pigs. And we named her Florence because uh, the, the week that I rescued her was the week that Florence Henderson had died, the mom from Brady Bunch. And she had six chicks, like the six Brady Bunch. So... Uh, <laughs> I thought that worked. So that's Florence. And you could go out and meet her at Goatlandia in Santa Rosa if you want to. Um, but, you know, chickens are just amazing. They really are. And we are learning scientifically that they are incredible creatures. The, 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 the scientific research that's been done in the last, you know, 10 to 15 years on chicken cognitive ability and um, uh, the brain it really dispels hundreds of years of myth of chickens being, you know, stupid and not, um, not capable in that way. Uh, it's amazing what we found, um, you know, the, the, their cognitive function now, far, they're far more intelligent and sophisticated than previous, previously believed. They express emotions like grief and fear, enthusiasm, anxiety, frustration, boredom, friendship. They're incredible. Um, in Scientific American, there was an article called uh, The Startling Intelligence of the Common Chicken. And they were found to be deceptive and cunning. They possess communication skills on par with those of some primates. And they use sophisticated signals to convey their intentions. They empathize with individuals in danger. They're incredible creatures. They deserve life, free of our imposition, free of our manipulation, free of our imposed suffering and slaughter. So, um, okay, so that's chickens. And I want to move on now to fish. Fishes, wonderful fish. Um, so this is a quote I love. I went snorkeling and noticed how gently the fish welcomed us into their world as compared with the violence in which we welcome them into ours. I became a vegetarian. And I hope now that she realizes and has learned about the dairy and egg industry <laughs> and has moved on to being vegan. Um, but, you know, fish, this is just incredible. So fish have been on the earth for more than 450 million years. Uh, they were well established long before the dinosaur. There's over 25,000 identified species of fish on earth, and there's estimated to be 15,000 more fish species that we haven't even identified yet. 15,000. Um, there's more species of fish than all the species of amphibian, reptiles, birds, and mammals combined. Wow, amazing, an amazing world in the ocean, and we're destroying it, we're destroying it. So how we're fishing these days, we um, drop these, go out in these big trawlers, drop miles and miles of netting, you can kind of, oh, see it, oh, okay, wait, let's uh, get to the next slide. You can see it over here um, on this side, miles and miles of netting that just scoop up 
the ocean, scoop up anything in its way, they pick out about 20% that can be sold and throw the rest back dead and dying. It's such a wasteful, wasteful industry. Um, the state of the world fisheries and aquaculture, it's a, a, a you know, yearly analysis by the UN, they concluded that over 80% of all marine fish stocks are currently fully exploited, overexploited, or depleted, including stocks of the seven largest prey fisheries. And they predict that the world's fisheries are due to collapse by 2048. 2048, no more fish. We keep going the way we're doing. Horrible. Yeah. So um, I was talking about all that gets thrown back dead. The industry calls it by, by catch. I call it by kill because it all dies. Uh, by kill, more than 7 million tons uh, is, is thrown back, discarded, dead, and dying back into the ocean to rot. Such a waste. Over 300,000 seabirds, such as non-target fish species, sea turtles, dolphins, whales, albatross, seabirds, over 100 million sharks killed by this by kill. And for every pound of shrimp that's netted in the Gulf of Mexico, four pounds of by kill is wasted and thrown back dead. I mean, I, I wish someone could like have their meal and then also have sitting at the table all, you know, the dead sea turtle and the, you know, the four, four pounds of, of fish that, that didn't get eaten and see what kind of waste they're creating. Um, that would be a good video, Kamal. We should do that. <laughs> um, anyway, okay, endangered species. So not only are endangered species now starving without enough food to eat um, due to the overfishing that we're causing, they're, they're caught in all this fishing line, the fishing nets and the fishing line. They get caught in it and drown. Uh, it's just brutal. Um, and species collapse. Oh, there we go. There's the line. I knew it was going to come in second. Okay. Species collapse, so thanks to sushi lovers and moms making tuna fish sandwiches, the bluefin tuna is now on the brink of extinction. Uh, there's been a 96% drop, 96% drop in the species, um, and scientists say that if current trends continue, it will be extinct very soon. Uh, and actually, um, uh, the... <laughs> The, the, the fishermen and, and, and industry um, business people are actually hoarding um, the last of their bodies in frozen warehouses and like freezer warehouses waiting for the extinction. And then they're going to open those doors and sell their, the last bodies for the highest bid, you know, for lots of money. Horrible. I mean, that is disgusting, yeah. Uh, um, so... Very wasteful industry. Between tw uh, 2001 and 2008, in the Gulf of Mexico alone, long line fishing of tuna killed um, 11,000 sea turtles, 3,000 seabirds, almost 3,000 marine mammals. Uh, in addition, 75% of the tuna that were caught were juveniles and not of market weight. So they just throw them back dead. They could, no time for them to reproduce, no time for them to live. It's horrible. Um, okay. And this, oh, this is really fascinating. So when I was uh, researching my book, I learned that, oh, no, we're going to go with this one first. Well, this is fascinating, too. <laughs> it's all fascinating. Uh, but half the world's fish catch is fed to livestock. In fact, more fish are consumed by U.S. livestock than by the entire human population of all the countries of Western Europe combined. It's considered a cheap uh, protein source. What a waste. What an absolute waste. Uh, and then... This is amazing. So exploitation of the oceans, us overfishing these oceans, is contributing to climate change. So how this works is fish, when they're you know, naturally in the ocean, they uh, poop. <laughs> so there's waste. There's fish poop uh, that dilutes into the water, absorbs the carbon. This is a natural process. It's been happening for millions of years. The fish poop in the water absorbs the carbon because of the massive overfishing there's not that carbon sink. There's not that waste to pull the carbon out uh, anymore. And um, now, because of overfishing, we're actually hastening climate change in another way. I mean, it just shows you how 
interconnected everything is, you know, just how intimately interconnected and how we need animals. It drives me crazy when someone says, well, what, what are, what's the animals or what are they for if not to eat? You know, <laughs> like, they're keeping this planet alive. They're part of this biosphere. They're part of this beautiful world that we have and they're an integral part. We have no right to think that they have no purpose other than for ourselves. Um, we'd be fine if we, I mean, the earth would be fine if we were gone. Actually, the earth would be much better off, wouldn't it? Let's think about that for a minute. <laughs> um, okay. Sustainable fishing, not the way to go. We're seeing sustainable fishing labels on um, uh, fish at, you know, Walmart, even at like Costco and, and, and uh, 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 you know, places like that, uh, Whole Foods, everywhere. And uh, again, it's, it's the same kind, you, I have it in my book, but it's the same kind of lack of regulation uh, on these labels that goes on in the mammals, same as, um, you know, on land mammals, the, the uh, marine, I'm sorry, the farmed animals, same with marine mammals and marine animals. Um, nobody's, there's not going to be a, 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 a watchdog group going out on these four-week fishing trips. You know, it's just not going to happen. So it's just the fishermen's own word. Um, and this is a great example of where, um, you know, there's a, a, a massive amount of this bykill, and that's the um, sustainably caught labeled Nova Scotia swordfish, uh, tens of thousands of non-target endangered blue shark are killed in the fishing of this swordfish. So, you know, how can that be called sustainable? Well, these labels mean nothing. Okay, and finally, fish feel. Uh, it has been absolutely scientifically proven that fish feel pain. They are an invertebrate animal. They feel pain the way that we do. Uh, they have a similar central nervous system. In fact, they have the same central, central nervous system, most fish. Uh, as every other invertebrate, vertebrate animal, not invertebrate, but vertebrae. <laughs> and um, when exposed to something painful, they try to escape. When getting pain killers, their behavior you know, changes to not be as distressed. They feel pain. Absolutely, they feel pain. Uh, and beyond that, we're at learning uh, with, through fascinating scientific studies that fish actually uh, feel all kinds of amazing emotions. We have discovered they feel fear, joy, friendship. It's incredible. And they are sentient. They're sentient beings. Scientifically proven. Even the octopus has been labeled and put in the category of sentient beings. Uh, and, you know, the fish and chickens are actually excluded from the uh, Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, one of the very few uh, regulations that we have, federal regulations that we have to protect farmed animals or give them a little, some kind of uh, amount of relief uh, from what they endure. And uh, what the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act says is that a, an animal has to uh, be rendered unconscious before it is slaughtered, before he or she is slaughtered, excuse me. And, um, but fish and chicken are excluded from the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, uh, as well as rabbits and turkeys and other birds. Uh, so it only applies really to cows and pigs. Uh, so uh, when you know w how we kill the fish is brutal. It's brutal. We take them out of the water to suffocate. It's like us drowning. It's a slow, violent, painful way to die. It's horrible. And they feel that. So I'm going to conclude. <clears throat> excuse me, the environmental section, eating vegan is eating green. Choosing a plant-based diet is one of the most powerful things you can do to help save the planet. Um, okay, I would love a time check. Where are we? Awesome, perfect. Okay, so the reason I have this here, and I meant to mention it in the beginning, is I have a little bit of a show and tell. Okay. And we're, we're going we're gonna to completely switch gears now. Um, I, want, I wanted to do actually three talks. <laughs> <laughs> but I would put it in one, so I wasn't the only one. I wanted to do chickens, I wanted to do fish, and I actually tried to find someone that could do the fish part, uh, the fish talk, and I was not able to find someone. Kevin tried to help me. We really looked uh, for someone that could, could speak on the fish, and it just didn't work out with people's schedules and stuff. But anyway, uh, but this is, this is the bonus, the bonus talk. <laughs> okay? Um, 
Hey choir, let's sing louder. Now, the reason I uh, wanna do this little section, and this is about our personal impact on the environment and how we, um, both vegan, non-vegan, veg curious, anybody can do better, okay? And, uh, you know, we, we, can't, we can't all live like this. I wish we could. This is where I wanna live eventually, right? You know, the Cobb house and off the grid, and it'd be so groovy, but, you know, we live, uh, most of us live in the real world. We live in, uh, you know, our um, whatever, <laughs> in, in, you know, what we have to, where, where we have to, how we have to do it. Uh, but there's, there's ways we can do it better. There's ways we can do it better. And, and what inspired me to do this was numerous things. Um, one is uh, just my frustration with seeing vegans that, you know, you think are conscious on, on a certain level, but then, you know, they're getting their, 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 their to-go coffee mug every day and not bringing their own coffee mug or, you know, something like this. And it's just like, you know, let's make these connections. I mean, when we're destroying the environment, that's hurting animals. <laughs> it's, it's not vegan to not be environmental, you know. Um, so trying to, to bring all that together. Um, also, like, just, just the other day I was at an... Uh, it was an eco-theology conference on sustainability. Eco-theology conference on sustainability. These are some of the top minds in academia doing papers and everything on ecological issues and sustainability issues, and here comes lunch. <laughs> and it's like facepalm, you know. Um, I mean, not only is there animal products, but there's, you know, everybody's got their paper plate and their, you know, their plastic fork and the paper cup. And I'm just like, oh, God, what the hell? So, <laughs> so this is, I'm going to show you what I do. Okay. And I, I will not show you anything that I don't do personally or tell you about anything that I don't do personally. And I know there's more I could do. And I'm sure everybody would have, has things that they do that are probably what I don't do, you know what I mean? So everybody's got something, but this, I'll show you what I do so that you can, can hopefully inspire you, okay? So first thing first, seems easy enough, right? Coffee mugs. I always, I have like five of these, okay? So I keep them in rotation. I keep one in my car, I keep one in my bag. I always have a bag like this in the car, okay, with all this stuff in it, and you keep, and have a bunch of them and keep it in rotation. Water, you know? You got your water bottle. Now, some people don't like plastic. I like glass. Um, so these are glass water bottles. Um, we actually have a really cool vendor out here that's doing clay bottles. So you should go check them out. They're the ones that actually started Clean Canteen. If you know Clean Canteen, the metal bottles. And they felt that the metal was not eco enough, and they went further. Pretty, you know, cool. Um, so, and then also... <clears throat> I always keep bandanas in my purse, in my car. These are great instead of using paper napkins or paper towels. Um, you know, if I'm out and the restaurant only has paper napkins, I'll pull one of these out of my purse and use this. If I'm at, in the bathroom and all they've got is paper, uh, paper, um, paper towels to, to dry my hands, I, I have this little, you know, thing I do. Um, I open my purse. Um, thank you. Uh, open my purse. Uh, I pull one of these to the surface, then I wash my hands, and I'm able to just grab it really quick, so I don't have to dig in my purse with wet hands. You know, so you do, you have little tricks, okay? So I have my bandanas, these are great. I never use paper napkins or paper pe towels. Uh, and then I, often, I keep these uh, kind of containers. And there's so many different kinds. Of course, you, you have these in your house. Everybody here has these in their house for leftovers, right? Uh, sometimes they're plastic, sometimes they're glass. These ones happen to be metal. That's what I like um, for these. And I, I keep, woo, yeah, it's metal. <laughs> and I keep a stack of them, you know, so there's several different sizes. So that if I'm, you know, at a restaurant and there's leftover food, instead of getting a to-go container, I put it in this. Uh, if I go to Timeless Cafe and want to get, you know, a vegan croissant and a vegan cupcake and all kinds of yum, I bring this. Right? So, you know, it, it just, and, and, and oftentimes I will go into the place and I'll have forgotten it in my car, but I go back to the damn car, okay? It's not that hard. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, another thing is utensils. So there's these great uh, to-go wear things, little pack of utensils that are bamboo. Um, I actually lost, they come with the bamboo chopsticks and I lost them, so I just stuck some other chopsticks in there. Um, but, uh, you know, and it comes with a knife, too. I never use a knife, so I just take it out. 
so this is a great little thing you can keep in your purse. But if you don't want to buy one of these, or, you know, I mean, they still have to cut the bamboo tree. So if you want to go completely eco or just do it yourself, look, the, you have, everybody has this in their kitchen. It's a dish towel. I wrap it up. <laughs> fork and spoon, okay? Keep it in your car. Keep it in your bag. Keep it in your purse. And today, uh, we have, um, actually, Flacos is coming. Hopefully, they'll be set up. They were supposed to be here at 11. <laughs> They're running late. Um, they had, actually, it was, uh, anyway, it's not their fault. But they, they had a big van that they couldn't find parking for, and they had to go back and change to a smaller vehicle. So I feel bad that they had to do that. But uh, so definitely please support them. And uh, they're going to have lunch and a tama uh, tamales for lunch. Um, but see, if you had all this, you wouldn't have to use the throwaway. And even though, you know, what they'll have is compostable, it still takes energy. It still takes resources even to build. That's not, we shouldn't, we should look at the compostable as a great step. It's a great way to, you know, to go for now. But this is what we have to do in the future. This is the where, where we need to go. We stop, need to stop being a disposable, throwaway society. And it's easy. It's nothing but a bag in my car. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, one more, and I, I will take some questions. Uh, I think we'll have a little bit of time. One more quick thing I do want to mention is cotton. Um, organic cotton. Please only buy organic cotton. And buy at thrift stores. Don't buy new. Um, but cotton, when you buy cotton that's not organic, it's one of the most heavily sprayed crops that there is. Uh, and the crazy thing is that they can use these really scary chemicals that they can't even use on food crops because it's not a food crop. They can get away with using these even more intense, harsh, awful chemicals. Um, so please don't, don't believe the natural cotton commercials. Um, they're toxic and polluting. Um, so please only buy organic cotton or better yet, secondhand. Um, okay, we will take questions. And if anybody has something that they do that I didn't mention, um, you know, we can go further with that. But go ahead. I really liked a lot of your facts and data and graphs that you had in your PowerPoint. And I'd never known about those before. Um, and I have a lot of non-vegan friends that I'd like to share those with. And I was wondering if there was a way that you could make some of that information available to us. Maybe if we provide email. I did. Oh, in the book. <laughs> okay, so you have those facts in the book. the book. Okay, cool. Well, awesome then. Yeah, and it's available right on the table right there. <laughs> Good to know. Right Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I was wondering if you could dispel the myth about certified humane labels because I have friends who will say, well, it's okay. I eat certified humane, which is supposed to be different than free range. And to what extent is it different than free range? And I mean, I have a good idea, but I'm just... Um, again, it's all in the book. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but briefly, yeah, no, but briefly, these labels are um, so, they're unregulated. Uh, it's basically a farmer gets um, a, a, a form to fill out. He fills out the form, puts whatever he wants, sends it back in, and they award him the, there's no on-site inspection. No one gets denied these labels. You know, it's, uh, yeah, thank you. It's really, um, it, it means nothing. And when I did the research for the book, I was, you know, I was, I was expecting to say, uh, you know, throughout the book that I was going to say, oh, well, you know, certified humane's better, but going vegan's best. Or, you know, free range is better, but going vegan's best. No. No. In my research, going to all these different farms, and I went to numerous farms and talked to farmers. I talked to people that had worked in these farms. I talked to people that had rescued animals from these farms. And what I found is there's such a variety uh, of, of farming as far as how intense and horrible it is, most of it is, is horrible, um, that you just really can't determine what's going on, on uh, from one label to another. It, it really means nothing. Um, but in general, there's very little difference. I mean, there's very little difference. They'll maybe have some regulation on the space, so they're getting like, you know, a few more inches of space, you know, things like that. They're, it's so little, and they'll, 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 they'll have things like, um, oh, well, you, they have to have enough food, enough water. Well, everybody's, they want, <laughs> they're, they're fattening them up for slaughter. They're all getting enough food and water. You know, just ridiculous things like this that they're trying to make you, appease, you know, the, the, hmm? The eggs. No, 
No, it doesn't. Unfortunately, it doesn't. Those eggs, that certified humane eggs can still, the, the chickens can still be debeaked. Uh, they can still never see the light of day. Uh, they can still go to slaughter at a, you know, two years at the, uh, you know, the most, um, because that's about when their egg production begins to decline. Uh, they can still be in in incredibly confined areas where they're, you know, uh, breathing the ammonia of their own uh, waste. It's, you know, it's, yeah. But again, I, 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 I write it even more eloquently in the book. <laughs> um, do we have time for one more question? The plastic, the, the, um, the plant plastic forks and spoons and so forth uh, have additives. They're not just starch. They have additives in them that are toxic and can leach out of it because you put it in your mouth, you put it in a wet environment. Um, so the Center for Environmental Health, they've got, they've got all, 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 the, all the goods on this. Uh, they, they engaged a uh, lab called Servicam that had come out with new ways of finding out how toxic things were, and they showed that a great many things that you've never, uh, plastics, yeah. that you, you yeah. Know, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and you know, what's gonna come up next is a bunch of short videos. We're gonna have a mini film fest, mini eco film fest, ooh, and, uh, and I think there's one that's on plastics and, and all kinds of waste, so, you know, just reduce as much as you can, care, care for the earth, please. Make this day an inspiration to you to, um, to go vegan if you're not, to make some change that inspires you that's better for the planet. Um, thank you all so much.